Isabel here. I wanted to introduce you to the Pleats and Thank You Jumpsuit Sew Along video tutorial. The Pleats and Thank You pattern comes with a jumpsuit view and a top view. This video is specifically following along the instructions to the jumpsuit view. You can purchase the PDF sewing pattern directly on my website, which I'll link below. The video will show you all the options, so you'll see in the instructions that there are multiple ways to finish each seam. So if you want to use the French seam, you can follow the specific section for how to finish the seam with a French seam, versus if you want to use an overlock or a zigzag stitch to finish the raw edges, then you can follow the section for that. They are separated and there's timestamps below, so you can just jump ahead to the section that you want to follow, and all the steps are labeled according to how the jumpsuit instructions are labeled in your PDF download, so it should be pretty easy to correspond. There are a few sections where I will reference a separate stitch instruction video. Those are going to be in my stitch resource library, and you can just have that open in a separate tab and just reference it when you need it. So there will be a how to sew a clean finish seam finish, how to hand sew a button with a thread shank, how to sew a thread chain belt loop, and how to hand sew a thread eyelet. There's also a separate short video for how to sew down the pleats at the waist. If that's something that you're interested in doing, I walk you through the way I would approach doing it. The exact measurements vary from person to person, so you can just check out the video to get a general guide of how I would approach doing that for your personal preference. Overall, it's a pretty straightforward sewing pattern and there is not so many seams. There's just a few trickier areas where I think the video can come in really handy, like putting in the shoulder pads or doing the burrito method for finishing the armholes. So I'm happy to be able to offer the video to show you those details. Let me know if you have any other questions that aren't covered in the video. I'm happy to answer and I will see you next time. Thank you. Bye. Here are the materials you will need your self fabric or your main fabric. The Pleats and Thank You jumpsuit is best suited for light to midweight woven materials. Lightweight to midweight fusible interfacing. Matching all purpose thread to your fabric. Optional top stitching thread. You can use a contrast color if you want. One pair of shoulder pads, half an inch or 13 millimeters thick. The recommended size is also four and three quarters inch along the shoulder seam. I'll show you later in the video how to adjust a shoulder pad that's slightly bigger. One or two buttons. These are 18 line or 7 16 inch or 11 millimeters in size, although a range of button sizes will work. For the belt option, you will need a buckle that measures two inches or five centimeters within the opening with a prong at the center bar or the sidebar. Although you can adjust the instructions slightly by just removing the eyelets if you want to use a slider buckle. Prepare your pattern for your chosen size. I like to use a notch cutter to cut out the notches along the edges of my pattern. This makes it easier for marking your fabric. I also like to use a screw punch to cut out any markings that are within the pattern pieces. Prepare your fabric by washing and drying it according to how you plan to wash and dry your finished garment. Then press the fabric nice and flat. Cut out your fabric according to your size and fabric width layout. Cut out your fusible interfacing. If you're planning to make the belt, you will also need to cut out the fusible interfacing for your belt pattern pieces. Mark your notches. Make sure to mark the center front notch on any pattern pieces that are cut on the fold. Apply your fusible interfacing. Using the appropriate iron setting for your fabric choice, lay your front facing fabric face down and your matching interfacing piece glue side down on top. Press slowly and carefully over the interfacing until it adheres to the fabric. Lift your iron up and spot press it first to make sure you do not stretch the interfacing as you move the iron. Repeat this method for the back facing pieces. If you are making a belt, repeat this method for the belt long section and the belt short section pieces as well. Stay stitch your neckline on the front pieces using roughly an eighth of an inch or three millimeters seam allowance. Following the marked notches on your front pieces, fold your pleats according to the paper pattern. With right sides facing, pin the first notch closest to the neckline to the second notch along the shoulder edge. 
The fold of the pleat on the wrong side of your fabric should be brought towards the neckline. Pin your second pleat in place by bringing the third notch over to the fourth notch, working away from the neckline. The fold of the pleat on the wrong side of your fabric should be brought towards the neckline again. Follow the arrows on your paper pattern to fold the correct direction. Repeat on the opposite side, making sure to fold in the opposite direction. Sew a straight stitch along your shoulder edge, securing the folded pleats in place, using roughly an eighth of an inch or three millimeter seam allowance. Press your folded pleats in place. Repeat steps 6A through 6D for your back pieces. Sew your center front seam together with either the clean finish option or the overlock or zigzag stitch option as follows. This is the clean finish option. Pin your front pieces right sides together along the center front rise. Sew with half an inch or 13 millimeter seam allowance. Finish the raw edges of your seam allowance with a clean finish. You can watch my separate detailed stitch instruction video for how to sew a clean finish, which is linked below. Here is the overlock or zigzag stitch option. Finish the raw edges of your front rise with an overlock or zigzag stitch. Pin your front pieces right sides together along the center front rise. Sew with half an inch or 13 millimeter seam allowance. Press your seam allowances open. If you chose to finish the raw edges with an overlock or zigzag stitch, you may opt to do a decorative top stitch detail, which mimics how the clean finish looks when completed. Simply sew a top stitch along the center front seam on either side of the seam using a quarter inch or six millimeter seam allowance. My presser foot is about a quarter inch or six millimeters wide, so I'm just using it as a guide, but you can also draw in your seam allowance if you like. Sew your center back seam together with either the clean finish option or the overlock or zigzag stitch option as follows. Here's how you start the clean finish option. Pin your back pieces right sides together along the center back rise from the inseam until the first notch. Make sure to set your stitch length back to a standard length after top stitching. Sew with half an inch or 13 millimeter seam allowance from the inseam up until the first notch only. Measure one inch or two and a half centimeters down from the notch or the top of your stitch line. Clip the seam allowance by a quarter inch or six millimeters at this one inch or two and a half centimeter measurement. Finish the raw edges of your seam allowance with a clean finish from the clipped seam allowance down to the inseam. You can see my separate detailed stitch instruction video for how to sew a clean finish, which is linked below. You are only sewing a clean finish from the clipped seam allowance down to the inseam. And here is how I would do the overlock or zigzag stitch option. Sew along the center back rise with an overlock or zigzag stitch.
Pin your back pieces right sides together along the center back rise from the inseam up until the first notch. Sew so with half an inch or 13 millimeter seam allowance from the inseam up until the first notch only. Measure one inch or two and a half centimeters down from the notch or the top of your stitch line. Clip the seam allowance by a quarter inch or six millimeters at this one inch or two and a half centimeter measurement. Press your seam allowances open. If you chose to finish the raw edges with an overlock or zigzag stitch, you may opt to do a decorative top stitch detail, which mimics how the clean finish looks when completed. Simply sew a top stitch along the center back seam on either side of the seam using a quarter inch or six millimeter seam allowance, only from the clipped seam allowance down to the inseam. You will top stitch the remaining section of the keyhole opening later on. I prefer to hand tie a knot on the inside of my garment with my top stitching thread and bobbin thread rather than back stitching at the beginning and ending of a top stitching line. I think it just looks a little neater in the end. Pin your front to your back with right sides together along the shoulder edges, matching the pleats along the way. The shoulder edges have a diagonal corner edge along the arm's eye with a marked dot. Make sure to match the marked dot and diagonal corner edges as you pin. Sew together with half an inch or 13 millimeter seam allowance. Pivot your needle at the marked dot to continue stitching along the diagonal corner edge with half an inch or 13 millimeter seam allowance. Notch the corner edge where you pivoted your needle. Press your seam allowances open. I find this easiest to do with a tailor's ham or sleeve board so that you can create the three dimensional corner along the shoulder edge. Pin your front facing right sides together with your back facing pieces along the shoulder edges. Sew with half an inch or 13 millimeter seam allowance. Press your seam allowances open. Pin your back facing pieces right sides together from the hem up until the first notch. Sew with half an inch or 13 millimeter seam allowance just from the hem up until the first notch. Press your seam allowances open. From now on, your front facing and back facing will be referred to as your facing. Fold your button loop right sides together lengthwise and pin. 
so with a quarter inch or six millimeter seam allowance. Trim your seam allowance down to an eighth of an inch or three millimeters. Turn your button loop right side out using a loop turner or a tiny safety pen. Here I'm using a loop turner. Press the seam allowance directly on the edge. Fold your button loop in half and layer one edge on top of the other to create a flat loop. Trim the loop to be one inch or two and a half centimeters total when folded into this loop. Repeat these steps for your second button loop if you want your finished garment to have two buttons along the keyhole opening. Pin the button loop on the face side of the left back center back edge. The top button loop should be placed 3 eighths of an inch or 1 centimeter down from the center back neckline edge. The optional bottom button loop should be placed at the notch along the center back edge. The button loops should be pinned while folded in half to form a flat loop. The rounded loop edge should be coming away from the center back raw edge. So with a quarter inch or six millimeter seam allowance to secure the button loop in place. Pin your facing right sides together with your front and back along the neckline matching shoulder seams and center back edges. The facing piece is an eighth of an inch or three millimeters smaller along the neckline edge, so you will want to ease the neckline together to match them. This slight difference in size helps force the facing to roll inwards while wearing the finished garment. Make sure not to pin your button loop within the neckline, rather keep it just below. Sew together with a quarter inch or six millimeter seam allowance. Press the seam allowance towards the facing. You may find it helpful to use a rounded surface for this step, such as a tailor's ham, the rounded tip of your ironing board, or even a rolled up towel. Sew an understitch along the neckline on the facing, making sure to catch the seam allowance on the underneath side. The top button loop should be free, and the understitch should be on top of the seam allowance underneath. Pin your facing right sides together with your back along the center back raw edges. Pin just the left side first, making sure to keep the button loop sandwiched in between. You will need to gently pull your seam allowance on the back and facing over towards the right at the bottom of the keyhole opening. 
Sew with half an inch or 13 millimeter seam allowance, continuing the stitch line exactly from where you previously left off below the notch up to the neckline. Avoid sewing over your previous stitch line, otherwise you may end up with an unwanted bump in the intersection of the center back seam and the keyhole opening. Better to even leave a teeny tiny space between the stitch lines rather than overlapping them. Repeat this same method for the right side, gently pulling the seam allowance on the back and facing over towards the left to continue the stitch line seamlessly. Sew so with half an inch or 13 millimeter seam allowance, continuing the stitch line exactly from where you previously left off below the notch up to the neckline. Trim your center back corners along the seam allowance. Turn your garment right side out. Press the center back seams to be directly on the edge, with the button loop sticking out along the left side. I accidentally sewed my button loops to the right side, so if you did the same, no problem, you'll just be buttoning it the opposite direction. Here's the tiny little hole that results if you leave a little space between your stitch lines. It's perfectly fine and it won't affect the final garment. Press the center back seams to be directly on the edge with the button loop sticking out. The bottom of your keyhole should be able to neatly lie flat. Press the neckline edge so that the seam rolls slightly under, which should naturally happen due to the understitch. With the body face up, begin rolling the left side of the body and facing towards the right side of the body. Continue rolling the body and facing together until the garment is nicely on top of the right shoulder. Bring the right armhole edge of your facing under the rolled up piece and around the top to meet the right armhole edge of your body, wrapping the rolled up garment like a burrito. Pin the right armhole edges right sides together. Match the shoulder seams and notches along the way. You will need to ease the edges together because the facing armhole is an eighth of an inch or three millimeters smaller than the body armhole edge. The slight difference in size helps force the facing to roll inwards while wearing the finished garment. Sew along the armhole edge with a quarter inch or six millimeter seam allowance. Make sure to sew along the straight top edge of your sides as well with a quarter inch or six millimeter seam allowance and pivot your needle to continue along the curved armhole. Place your shoulder pad face down on top of the wrong side of your shoulder seam on the body layer. The face side of your shoulder pad is the convex side, the side that domes up rather than is hollowed out. 
Pin the shoulder pad ever so slightly over the previous stitch line using the notches along the armhole to indicate the start and end of your shoulder pad location. You will want to gently roll the bottom edge of your shoulder pad, which is the edge that is currently facing up, away from the lifted side edge to give yourself a place to stitch it down without flattening the shoulder pad. Sew the shoulder pad in place using a quarter inch or six millimeter seam allowance, almost sewing with the shoulder pad positioned vertically up away from the garment to prevent flattening the shoulder pad edge. Avoid sewing directly through the actual padding of your shoulder pad. Depending on what type of shoulder pad you are using, sew through just the casing layer around the padding, which is what I'm doing here, or just the layer facing up currently which is what I will show you in the next section. You may wish to use a zigzag stitch for this step, which is also what I will show you in the following section. Here is another type of shoulder pad. This shoulder pad is not symmetrical. You can see when you fold it at the notch that there's two separate lengths. Typically, if the shoulder pad is not symmetrical, the longer section is placed at the back. The notch is supposed to indicate the shoulder seam. The shoulder pad is bigger than the recommended size. I'm going to show you how to trim it down. Measure four and three quarters inch or 12 centimeters across the width of the shoulder pad. This is where the shoulder seam edge will go. Measure seven and three quarters inch or 19.7 centimeters in length across the long edge of the shoulder pad. Following the curve of the pre-existing shoulder pad, trim away the excess. You can see how the shoulder pad has two slightly different sizes. This is like grading seams. So now we're going to separate the two layers and grade the edges. Repeat this exact same method for your second shoulder pad. Depending on the shoulder pad you are using, make sure to align the correct orientation to the front and back to get the best possible shape in the end. Typically, if the shoulder pad is not symmetrical, the longer section is placed at the back. Since this is a different type of shoulder pad, I'm going to show you how to pin this one as well. I'm basically just separating the layers so that I'm only pinning the top layer and leaving the filling layer free. Here are the settings I'm using for a zigzag stitch. For sewing with a zigzag stitch, just catch the very edge of the shoulder pad on one side of the zigzag stitch sewing within the seam allowance along your armhole. Avoid sewing directly through the actual padding of your shoulder pad. Depending on what type of shoulder pad you are using, sew through just the casing layer around the padding or just the layer facing up currently. So here I'm just sewing through the layer facing up currently.
Here you can see the padding is still completely free and not flattened. And same with this one. I just sewed through the outer casing layer. Carefully turn your garment right side out. This part may be a bit tricky, but do not worry. Just keep gently pulling the body of the garment out from within the burrito, and you will eventually see your beautifully finished armhole. Give your armhole seam a little press using a curved surface to maintain the shaping and not flattening the shoulder pad. Instead, press the shoulder pad area from the side to create a 3D edge. Beautifully finished on the inside and the outside. And the shoulder pad is completely hidden. Repeat all of these steps for your second armhole. The following step shows you how to sew your side seams and pockets using a French seam. If you wish to sew them using an overlock or zigzag stitch, skip this step and go to the next step instead. Pin one of your pocket bag pieces wrong sides together with your front body, matching the top of your pocket bag to the notch along the side edge of your front. Sew using a quarter inch or six millimeter seam allowance only along the pocket bag. Clip your seam allowance on the front body layer exactly where your pocket bag starts and ends. Trim your seam allowance down to 1 8 of an inch, or 3 millimeters, cutting through both layers. Press your seam allowance in one direction. Then enclose your seam allowances by flipping the pocket bag over to be right sides together with the front. Press your seam to be directly on the edge. Sew using a quarter inch or six millimeter seam allowance only along the pocket bag again. Open your piece to be flat and press your seam towards the pocket bag. Sew an understitch along the pocket bag, making sure to catch the seam underneath. Repeat these steps from the remaining pocket bag pieces, attaching one more to the opposite front and the remaining two to the back side edges. With wrong sides facing, bring your front and back together along the side edges, matching the pocket bags along the way. Pull the facing up away from the body as well as the seam allowance. Leave it free for the moment and start pinning from the armhole seam down to the hem. Match the armhole seam. Pin the pocket bags together as well. Sew using a quarter inch or six millimeter seam allowance along the side seam. Then pivot your needle when you get to your pocket bags and continue sewing 
with a quarter inch or six millimeters seam allowance around your pockets. Pivot your needle again at the bottom of your pocket bags and continue sewing down the side seam to the hem. Trim off 1 eighth of an inch or 3 millimeters from your seam allowance. Clip directly into the corners where you had to pivot your needle, at the top and the bottom of your pocket bag. Press your seam allowance in one direction along the side seams, ignoring the pocket for now. Turn your piece to be right sides facing, including the pocket, and press your side seams to be directly on the edge. Press the pocket bag seam to be directly on the edge as well. Pin the facing raw edges right sides together. Sew using half an inch or 13 millimeter seam allowance just along the facing edges. Transition to sewing with a quarter inch or six millimeter seam allowance along the side seam. Then pivot your needle when you get to your pocket and continue sewing with a quarter inch or six millimeter seam allowance around your pockets. Pivot your needle again at the bottom of your pocket and continue sewing down the side seam to the hem. I like to sew a little horizontal line across the bottom of the pocket. I just find that this gives a little bit of a more relaxed finish at that join. Open your piece flat and press the side seams and pocket towards the front of your garment. I'm using a tailor's ham because I find it easier to have the area I'm pressing a little lifted up away from the rest of the garment. Fold your facing down and press the armhole seam to be rolled slightly inwards. Again, I'm using a tailor's ham here. And now you should have a finished pocket. Repeat all of these steps for the second side seam and pocket. The following step shows you how to sew your side seams and pockets using an overlock or zigzag stitch. If you wish to sew them using a French seam, skip this step and follow the previous step instead. Finish the round edge of your pocket bags with an overlock or zigzag stitch. I like to give them a little press so that they lay flat afterwards. Pin one of your pocket bag pieces right sides together with your front body, matching the top of your pocket bag to the notch along the side edge of your front. Sew using half an inch or 13 millimeter seam allowance only along the pocket bag. 
Repeat these steps for the remaining pocket bag pieces, attaching one more to the opposite front and the remaining two to the back side edges. Pull the facing up away from the body as well as the seam allowance. Finish the side edges of your front and back with an overlock or zigzag stitch, sewing from the facing down along the side seam over the pocket bag side edge raw seam allowance as well. Press the pocket bag pieces away from the body. Press the seam allowance towards the pocket bag. Sew an understitch along the pocket bag, making sure to catch the seam allowance underneath. With right sides facing, bring your front and back together along the side edges, matching the pocket bags along the way. Pull the facing up away from the body. Pin the facing together along the side edges and match the armhole seam. Continue pinning from the armhole seam down along the side edges of the front and back all the way to the hem. Pin the pocket bags together as well. Sew using half an inch or 13 millimeter seam allowance along the facing edges and side edges. Pivot your needle when you get to the pocket and continue sewing with half an inch or 13 millimeter seam allowance around your pockets. Pivot your needle again at the bottom of your pocket and continue sewing down the side seam to the hem. Open your piece flat and press the side seams and pocket towards the front of your garment. Fold your facing down and press the armhole seam to be rolled slightly inwards. I find it easiest to use a tailor's ham during this section as well. Repeat these steps for the second side seam and pocket. The following step shows you how to sew your inseam using a French seam. If you wish to sew your inseam using an overlock or zigzag stitch, skip this step and follow the next step instead. Bring the pieces wrong sides together. Pin your front and back together along the inseam edges. I like to match the center front rise and center back rise seams first and then work my way down to the hem along either leg. Sew with a quarter inch or six millimeter seam allowance. It is best to sew from the center down to the hem and then repeat, rather than sewing in one long seam. This helps to keep the leg balanced in the finished garment. Trim off 1 eighth of an inch or 3 millimeters from your seam allowance. Press your seam allowance in one direction. Flip your piece to be right sides together and press your seam to be directly on the edge. Sew with a quarter inch or six millimeter seam allowance again. 
It is best to sew from the center down to the hem and then repeat, rather than sewing in one long seam. Press the seam towards the back. The following step shows you how to sew your inseam using an overlock or a zigzag stitch. If you wish to sew your inseam using a French seam, skip this step and follow the previous step instead. Bring the pieces right sides together. Pin your front and back together along the inseam edges. Match the center front and center back seam along the way. I like to match the seams first and then work my way down along either leg. Sew with half an inch or 13 millimeter seam allowance. It is best to sew from the center down to the hem and then repeat, rather than sewing in one long seam. This helps to keep the leg balanced in the finished garment. Finish the seam allowance with an overlock or zigzag stitch. Press the seam allowance towards the back. Pre-press half an inch or 13 millimeters under along the top edge of your front hem facing and back hem facing. The top edge is the longer edge without any notches. With right sides facing, Pin the front hem facing and back hem facing together along the side edges. Match the notched inseam edges together. Unfold the top edge for now. Sew with half an inch or 13 millimeter seam allowance. Press your seam allowances open. With right sides together, pin the front hem facing and back hem facing to the bottom edge of your front and back legs. Match the single notch on the bottom edge of your front hem facing to the single notch on the hem of your front leg. Match the double notch on the bottom edge of your back hem facing to the double notch on the hem of your back leg. Match the side seams. Sew with half an inch or 13 millimeter seam allowance. Press the seam allowance away from the hem facing. I find it easiest to use a tailor's hem or something in between so that I'm only pressing the top layer. Refold the top edge that was previously pressed under half an inch or 13 millimeters. Press again if needed. Fold your hem facing up towards the inside of your front and back leg. Press the seam to be directly on the edge at the hem of your leg. With the half inch or 13 millimeters folded under along the top edge of your hem facing, pin the hem facing in place along this top edge. Make sure it is completely flat against the leg as you pin it in place. Otherwise, it may cause bubbling while wearing. Match the side seams. Sew an edge stitch along the top edge of your hem facing. Give the final hem another press. Finish the bottom hem of your facing with option one or two. Option one is what I'm showing you here, which is a single fold hem.
fold under a quarter inch or six millimeters along the entire hem of your facing and press. Sew with an edge stitch using an eighth of an inch or three millimeter seam allowance to secure the fold in place. Alternatively, you can use an overlock or zigzag stitch, which is option two. Finish the entire hem of your facing with an overlock or zigzag stitch. Try your best not to stretch the curves out as you sew. Otherwise, you may have unwanted bubbling while wearing the finished garment. Give the finished edge a press to help it lay flat while wearing. For both options of finishing your bottom hem of your facing, continue with this next step. Fold your facing back in place within the finished garment. Pin the facing to the body along the underarm side seam. Stitch in the ditch from the outside of your garment to secure the facing within the body just sewing the length of the facing along the side seam. Repeat on both side seams. If you did a clean finish or you chose to do the optional top stitching detail along the center back rise, then you will want to finish off the stitch line along the center back keyhole edges. Sew a top stitch from the top end of your previous stitch line along the center back edges up to the neckline, which is the very top of the keyhole opening. Use a quarter of an inch or six millimeter seam allowance and repeat on both sides of the keyhole opening. I like to tie my knots by hand if I'm using top stitching thread instead of using a back stitch. It just gives a little bit of a neater appearance and it flawlessly continues the previous stitch line to the new stitch line so you can't even tell where you started and stopped. For the top edge, I'm threading the thread ends into my needle and I'm hiding them within the facing and outer layer. And then you can just tie a knot by hand to secure the stitch line. and repeat for the other side. If you wish to add some additional shaping to the waistline, you can sew down your pleats at the waist. You can watch my separate video for how to sew down the optional pleats at the waist, which is linked below. If you're choosing to make the belt, make sure that the markings within the pattern pieces are marked on the right side of your fabric. With right sides facing, pin your belt long section and belt short section pieces together along the center back edges. The center back edges are the short edges that have a notch. Sew using half an inch or 13 millimeter seam allowance. Press your seam allowances open. Fold your belt in half lengthwise with right sides facing and pin together. I like to start where the seam is so that I make sure that my seam lines up. You can also pin together the short end of your belt long section. Starting with the belt short section, sew with half an inch or 13 millimeter seam allowance along the entire length. Continue on to the belt long section. 
Then pivot your needle and sew along the short end with half an inch or 13 millimeter seam allowance. Clip your corner along the sewn short end. Turn your belt right side out using a bobby pin or your favorite tool to push the sewn short end through the rest of the belt and out the open end. I like to use the bobby pen to push out the corners at the sewn short end as well. Then let it fall out the open end. Press your seams to be directly on the edge. Using the dot on the belt short section as placement, create an eyelet. Some sewing machines may have this feature for sewing a thread eyelet, but it can also easily be sewn by hand. You can follow my detailed stitch instruction video for how to sew a thread eyelet by hand, which is linked below. Another option is to use a metal grommet, as long as it is big enough to fit the prong on the buckle you plan to use. Fold the raw edge of the short end of your belt under by half an inch or 13 millimeters and press. Feed the prong of your buckle through the eyelet, coming from the back side of the belt up through to the front side of the belt. Bring the folded end down to the back side of the belt. Make sure your buckle is lying flat and pull the folded end of your belt taut. Pin in place. Sew along the folded edge to secure in place. Sew a rectangle to add extra security to the belt. Fold the belt loop in half right sides together and pin together lengthwise. Sew with a quarter inch or six millimeter seam allowance. Turn your belt loop right side out using a loop turner or safety pin. Press the seam to be directly on the edge. Fold the belt loop in half, bringing the two raw edges together. Sew together using half an inch or 13 millimeter seam allowance. Press your seam allowance open, moving the seam to be in the center of your belt loop. Flip the seam allowance to be within the belt loop. Slide the belt loop up along the belt. Align the belt loop over the folded under edge where you have previously sewn a rectangle. The belt loop seam should be on the back side of your belt. Move the front side of your belt loop out of the way as you sew the back side of your belt loop in place along one of the edges. You don't have to go all the way up and down the entire width of your belt. You can just sew just shy of the edges, just to secure the belt loop in place. And make sure that your belt loop is still free on the front. Try in your belt and mark where you want to close the prong on your buckle. The belt long section has a dot where the eyelet can be placed, but it is best to use your own personal preference for this marking. Repeat your chosen method for creating an eyelet by either using your sewing machine eyelet stitch, sewing a thread eyelet by hand, or using a metal grommet. See my detailed stitch instruction video for how to sew a thread eyelet by hand, linked below. With your garment wrong side out, mark the button placement on the facing by lining up the center back keyhole edges side by side. Mark where the button loop reaches to on the facing using your favorite marking tool.
Hand sew your chosen button on using a buttonhole stitch to create a thread shank, giving necessary space between the button and fabric for the button loop to rest well closed. You can check out my detailed stitch instruction video for how to sew a button on with a thread shank, which is linked below. Repeat this method for your second button. If you chose to sew a belt and would like to add thread chain belt loops to your jumpsuit, Try on your jumpsuit and mark the top and bottom of your belt placement along the side seams. Sew a thread chain with a finish length of 2 and a quarter inch or 5.7 centimeters on both sides. You can check out my detailed stitch instruction video for how to sew a thread chain linked below. And now you can hold your belt.